Pre-Med Office Hours, episode 147. I am Dr. Ryan Gray, your one of your hosts here. Today, I'm the founder of Medical School HQ, author of several books, the Pre-Med Playbook series, and co-founder at MAPT. And I am joined by a wonderful bunch of our <laughs> advisors. Um, <laughs> Courtney Lewis, I'll start with you. You are in the top today, top right uh today uh former director of admissions at burrell college of osteopathic medicine now one of our marvelous advisors how are you doing i'm good thanks for asking just got back from a trip to milwaukee to talk to pre-med advisors mm -hmm. and med schools and stay in the loop of things learned a lot of good information so doing well yeah those conferences are good uh sharing of brain power everyone can talk about the latest and greatest what's going on in the admissions world. So uh, we yeah. like going to those and staying staying in the loop. Uh, there are lots of companies out there who do pre-med advising that don't go to those don't hmm. don't go to those meetings. Hmm. Wonder <laughs> wonder how they're staying up to date. Wonder wonder. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Verenia Granham, former <laughs> assistant dean of pre health and STEM advising at Hofstra. Hello. We have a Hofstra person uh, speaking at MappedCon. Hmm. Um, Doctor uh, Ellen Miller. Do you know? Dr. Miller? I do. Yeah. Well, so. is it? So there's two actually at Hofstra of oh, the same there? name. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So, she's the director of the pre-health uh, office, I believe. Yeah. Yep. I know her very well. In fact, she's my former supervisor. <laughs> very fun. Yeah. Exciting. Yes. So awesome. How are you doing today, Verinia? Doing great. It's a beautiful day in New York. I live right next to JFK, so things are busy. If you hear a plane flying over today, they, the flight path is right over my house. Nice. Nice. So, well, yeah. <laughs> we are here for the next 45, 55 minutes to answer your pre-med questions. If you don't want to come on and be vulnerable, you can also use MAPT uh, as part of MAPT Pro specifically. Most of MAPT is free, but as part of MAPT Pro, which is our paid level $90 a year or $10 a month, you get access to us right through the platform. You can enter all of your courses, all of your uh, activities, MCAT, practice tests, real practice exams. Uh, you can upload your transcripts and go, hey, um, help me. Uh, you can upload your your prior AMCAS uh, application if you haven't gotten in and go, help me. I don't know what's going on. Um, all of that right inside of Map to Pro. So go check that out. All right. Uh, I thought we had a banner for that, but maybe not. <laughs> Let's rock and roll with some questions. Lindsay asks, a hello, mapped team. Is phlebotomy good for clinical experience despite only interacting with patients for a couple of minutes? Courtney Lewis, former director yeah. of admissions. Phlebotomy, poke, goodbye, poke, goodbye, <laughs> poke. Oh, you fainted. Let me help you out for a couple minutes. <laughs> It sure um, be me. Yeah. <laughs> it is Please. still helpful. I mean, you're you're still having to make it a comfortable experience for somebody. A lot of people are afraid of needles. And so it could be a high stress situation. You still need training to be able to do that. So all in all, yeah, it is still good clinical experience. Yeah, I think so. And they don't yeah. just let anyone poke your veins, right? You to... <laughs> Hopefully not. Are you Hopefully sure about not. that? I mean, <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. great experience. I like, I like the term that they use. One of my friends was being trained as a phlebotomist, and they called it digging for veins. Mm -hmm. like, you are never practicing on me, ever. Yeah. If you say digging for a vein. So, yeah. no, thank you. you. You should not dig. You should strike the vein immediately. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, it's good. Good clinical experience. David. Hello, David. I decided to postpone the MCAT to this cycle as a super non trad. Do schools look unfavorably on not applying after you've completed your prereqs? And how do admissions really see reapplicants? <laughs> Verenia, this seems like one mm -hmm. of those. There isn't a problem, but I'm going to see if I can make a problem kind of question. <laughs> I'm like, just like, look and see yeah, if I can find yeah. it. I, yeah. I, think, I think we know David. We do yeah. know David. Yeah. Yes. I think we know David. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully, David, you've you've kind of heard us repeatedly say um, 
they do really see reapplicants the same way they do any any you know anyone applying for the first time. You have just as much of an opportunity to show why you want to be a physician and why you'd be a good fit and all of that. Um, so no, they don't look at um, they don't look at you unfavorably if you don't apply right after completing your your prereqs. Take a look at, you know, all the non-traditional students who have come to this decision a little later in life, you know, whatever the reasons are, everyone has their own path to to why they want to be a physician. And that's the path they have to walk. Um, and and that's it. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems like David is basically saying, hey, um, uh, the, the the common thing I get from especially a lot of non-trads is like, hey, I didn't realize I wanted to be a doctor until like midway through college is that going to be a problem i'm like they're not looking for people like coming out of the womb wearing a white coat and stethoscope like it's just not it's yeah. not it's not um just yeah i don't it's know it's happens. yeah it's not what happens it's not what mm. happens your, your story is your story tell your story if you want to take a break for whatever reason after you finish your prereqs whether it's because of the mcat or you want to go explore a little bit like you'll be fine and yes, you may get a question for <laughs> always be prepared, right? You may get a right. question from some interviewers like, hey, why'd you why have you been delaying? Be prepared to answer that. That's it. Yeah. And then how do admissions really see reapplicants? Right. You have schools. I think it's Harvard. Harvard publicly states like you can't apply to their school more than twice. Um, they may have changed that. Maybe that's old, but there's, there's some random stuff like that out there. Yeah. There. There are schools, though, I mean, where it truly is, you know, you may not be fresh out of your undergrad, but you do have a wealth of life experience and knowledge and actually holding a job and things. So there is stuff that you'll get credit for that we really appreciate and really value. And so there's a lot of schools that are not put off in any way by having a non-traditional student because you know this is what you want to do. You had to make a conscious choice and pivot your life mm -hmm. for this. So if things don't sync up one right after the next, it's okay. If they feel like your coursework is relevant and fresh enough, you're able to you know, take that, translate it into an MCAT setting. These are all really great things. If they happen a month apart, great. If they happen a year apart, it's still one cycle. So it's, it's okay. It is okay, David. Welcome to the OPC, the overthinking pre-med club. <laughs> David is a, uh, good to ask questions though. Yep. A member in good standing. <laughs> a member in good standing. Yes. I don't know if your dues are up to date, David. <laughs> Texan 98 any advice for Texans applying AMCAS for a handful of schools? I don't want to get screened out because I'm from Texas. Oh, Courtney, the good old uh, yield protection law that uh, students are very afraid. The assumption is, and it, it's all over Reddit and SCN, which is how I started learning about this stuff, um, is that, uh, AMCAS schools will go, oh, you're from Texas and you have a good application, so therefore you're probably going to stay in Texas, so we're not going to waste an interview spot on you. Um, I feel like those platforms are like National Enquirer. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, Alien abducts uh, Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, where are they pulling this information? Um I think it is, you know, all jokes aside, I think it is good to check and make sure that the schools that you're applying to out of state, you know, accept out of state students. Um, but, but past that, you designated the school. That means you're interested, or hopefully it means that you're interested. And so they're going to look at it as if you are interested and that there is potential there. Um, when you can have a tie to an area or a school that's always beneficial, but if not, you still paid the money to send me your application. I'm still going to review it as if you wanted to matriculate here. So if a school is is doing their due diligence, that's the way that it's going to be viewed. But, you know, do your due diligence on the other side on on where you apply. But yeah, it's, it's one of those. Want. Exactly. It's one of those where I'm like, you can either say no for the school or you can have them say no, but at least yeah. give them a chance. 
Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's somebody wouldn't fill out a secondary and return it and have all of that work done if if it wasn't some type of connection there or opportunity. Now, if it ends up working out in the end, great. If it doesn't, that doesn't mean that there was any negativity on either side. You you want options and you can get a great education from a lot of institutions, basically all of them. It's just finding the fit. So I would say give yourself the best opportunity that you want to give yourself by applying broadly as you want to and, and go from there. All right. D. Helene, aiming for at least a 5'10", but scoring lower on full lengths, two wings be before the MCAT. Going into it optimistic, but in case I don't reach target score, can I retake in August and update schools with a higher score? Vernia, um, an August MCAT means mm -hmm. the score is coming out a month later. Mm -hmm. But if I know my months, I believe that is September. Um, yeah. Late, not late, doable. It's late. It is late. Um, you know, is it doable? I guess it's not ideal. Um, but basically, Helene, what they would do or, or D Helene is, is you're going to indicate that you have a pending or a future uh, MCAT test date. Um, they're going to wait until that score comes out. And now it's September. Um, so that's pushing you later into the cycle. Um, you know, you have to decide. Uh, I'm trying to see. They didn't say when they were taking it. Um, you have to decide if you're comfortable with that, with saying maybe I should just, you know, hold off, not apply, not retake it so late, take it later next year or whatever that may be. Um, because, like I said, waiting until your score comes out in September, that's just, you know, pushing you further and further into the cycle, which is just not ideal. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Madison, do mapped advisors help with personal statements? So through mapped, uh, through the mapped chat, which is part of mapped pro, we do not do essay editing. We do not do interview prep. It is strictly just um, kind of Q and a chat reviewing your, your activities, reviewing your GPA, all, all of your courses and stuff and offering you advice through that platform. If you are interested in having your personal statement uh, edited or given feedback, or you wanna do mock interviews or anything like that, we do do that as well. Uh, all of that is through Medical School HQ. So if you go to medicalschoolhq.net, click on the advising tab there, uh, all of those options are there for you. Gonzalo, how likely is it to get off a high priority wait list? <laughs> what a question. Courtney. <laughs> You're giving me anxiety here. Um, so it is all student movement driven for those that have been accepted. If you are on a wait list, that means all of the seats are full. Somebody could be holding four seats at for different schools, you don't know which one they're going to pick. They haven't been made to choose just yet. So there's some timelines that are coming up, some dates that you should keep an eye out for, because that's when you see the heaviest amounts of movement. And they're going to be happening within the next two, three weeks. So keep an eye out. Make sure you're checking your spam folder and things like that. But it, it really is on the school and then the movement. So there's an opportunity, yes, especially if they tell you that you're on a high priority list, but it will be student movement driven and you don't know how many people are going to drop. And so assume that you are getting in based on having things ready to go while also simultaneously assuming you are not getting in and continuing to do experiences and not let things get rusty and prepping application materials. So it is a hard place to be in, absolutely. But there is still a shot. 
So you want to be ready to jump on the opportunity should they call you up, but you won't know. And we can't tell you because until somebody moves, there's not a seat. Yeah, it's a hard time right now. Hard time. Uh, four days is the official, at least for AMCAS, mm-hmm. traffic rules time where there should theoretically be some movement uh, with with students dropping some acceptances. So fingers crossed, you're one of those people. Comus will be in three weeks. They'll drop that information. So for either nice. platform within the next couple of weeks, Hopefully, usually there's about a two week turnaround time that you give them to make a decision. Are you staying? Are you going? Are you going to release a seat or not? Um, And then things will start to kind of come out there. So keep an eye out. Check in. That's the timeline. RJ, freshman planning to graduate in three years, working as an EMT and scribe, uh, planning to start research and MCAT prep in the summer. Is it a good idea applying as a sophomore? What is the probability? We don't have good data on that, Verinia, other other than knowing you're older is is the Mm -hmm. trend these days, 23, 24. What were we going to say, Courtney? I don't think you can. I think there. I think you have to have at least seventy five percent of your coursework done, don't you? Well, they Unless they probably came in with a program. lot of credits. Yeah, they they probably came in with uh, dual enrollment credits. Is my assumption. Okay. My question is, what's the rush, RJ? <laughs> I don't, I never understand that. Yeah. Yeah, you're not. You know, you're not gaining anything by rushing through this graduating in three years it just seems to me like you're on this like fast-paced um plan when there's just no real legitimate need to i would consider taking your time making sure that this is your 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 understanding your motivation too for why you want to be a doctor because that's exactly what you're going to have to address in your application and sometimes that takes a little bit of time but at least you want to be measured and um intentional about everything that you're doing this isn't a race okay this is just you have your whole life ahead of you um take your time so the probabilities you know there aren't that many applicants that are applying at in that year um as ryan just said it's more common now to take a gap year and that's okay um enjoy this time you're gonna be in school for a very long time so yeah do the do the things you want to do now and that are fun for you medical school will be there yeah typically what we see the the issue with younger students applying and we've we've talked to 17 18 year olds who Mm -hmm. just we were either homeschooled or just super advanced and, and just sped through everything it, the biggest issue we typically see is just a lack of experience because mm-hmm. for a lot of jobs, the, these kind of volunteer or paid jobs, you have to be 18 for mm-hmm. patient contact. Mm-hmm. But if RJ is out there being EMT and a scribe, like it sounds like he's doing a lot of it already. So mm-hmm. uh, as long as uh, RJ, you're not treating it like check boxes and just yeah. kind of going down your list and going, okay, done, 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 done. What's next? Mm-hmm. That's yeah. right. Well, Rock and, and roll. And applying as a sophomore and you're looking at MCAT prep, if you haven't taken all of the prereq coursework yet, you may not have the material to actually get effective MCAT studying done, or you're going to have to self-teach yourself ahead of those classes. So I would say be thoughtful. I'm a bit perplexed by, by this timeline myself. So, yeah, yeah. Obi, what is the timeline for when we should take Casper during the application cycle? Right now. (laughs) May, June, July. Yeah. That's when. (laughs) Miriam, do schools do a recalculation of your GPA? My freshman and sophomore GPA are very low, 3.2, but my junior year has gone very well. Woohoo, congrats. I will also do well in my senior year. Will this matter? Courtney, I, I'm sure this is a very, uh, one, of, one of those questions that's like, it depends on the school. Um, talk about kind of your understanding of, of the back end, 
data software platforms that schools use and what they can and potentially can't do? Sure. So I think a lot of schools will go based off of what the application calculations are to receive kind of that that raw data but they are going to look at trends so i would say the fact that you are doing well in your upper division coursework for the last half of your schooling is very favorable right it's much better than having a drop or having a yo-yo where we don't know where you're coming to us are you are you this student or are you this one up here at the peak so I think the upper trend is always a favorable one to be on. It's going to kind of be indicative of who you are as a student at this point in your education, which is all good things. Some schools do have a process where they recalculate it. They may take the last 30 credits. They may take the last 60 credits. Sometimes if you have post back or graduate work, they will kind of rework it. You won't know if they're doing that or not and how they're going to look at things. Sometimes there'll be little indicators on their website, but a lot of the times you just won't know. Um, we have rubrics that we can use that will standardize any type of calculations or recalculations that we're going to do. So it would be in line for everybody that we're reviewing. But I would say for the most part, they're going to go based off of whatever comes from the platform in the application. That is the material we're going to use. Now, whether we look at trend or last credits, that's kind of beyond just the raw number that we're getting as well. Um, they will not, I would say, they won't recalculate your GPA. There may just be additional ways in which they look at it, but a recalculation won't happen. Yeah, it, it actually can. I mean, let me give you one yeah. example. I don't know if they're still doing it because the yeah. former the, the director of admissions at uh, University of Illinois, Chicago, Dr. Layla Amiri, she's mm -hmm. no longer at that school. Uh, I had her on the podcast a couple of years ago. And what she did, because she's a very empathetic human being, was she said, you know what? We know that life happens and you may have a death in the family. You may have a bad breakup right? Your first love in college and, and you break up and you have a bad year. UIC would actually be able to recalculate your GPA based on deleting a year's worth of poor grades. They would take that into account, but that's so school specific. You can't just assume that everyone does that. Right. Right. And then from a trend perspective, right? They're not technically recalculating your GPA, but they may look at like our, our friends at Norda College of Osteopathic Medicine, they publicly stated on the podcast, so the pre-med years podcast, if you haven't listened, um, that they look at the last 60 credit hours of undergrad and graduate. And that's how they kind of determine your um, your competitiveness and in, in your academic ability. UCF, their former director of admissions, again, I don't know if they still do it because it's a former director of admissions. They they stated to me like, hey, we look at the last 20 credit hours of science. That's how we will determine your academic ability. So it's it's so variable, Miriam, that the only thing in your control is doing well and let the schools do what they're going to do. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Aman, do leadership positions in university clubs count as non-clinical volunteering activities? I heard it's preferred if these types of activities are done in the local community instead. Vernia, mm -hmm. the, the question they ask is, do leadership positions, like mm -hmm. to me, why not classify that as That's, leadership versus yeah. non-clinical volunteering? Firstly, yes, that is correct. Now, if you're doing um, activities as part of being in that club, you can describe them in the, um, sorry, if you're doing volunteer experiences as part of being uh, uh, in that organization, then yeah, talk about that in your description, but it's a leadership position. It should be, you know, something separate. So yes, volunteering in the community is also important. Um, it's not a preference over one or the other, right? It's This is, this is when students try to just gamify the system. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I heard that this activity is more important. Right. Therefore, I'm going to label this random activity, this thing, right. even though it's kind of not like, yeah, stop playing games, my friends. Yeah, that's it. But, Courtney, do you, can you remember like 
like the weirdest potentially like classified thing that's like why are, why did you mark this that like this <laughs> the one that immediately comes to mind is somebody in their extracurriculars put being a husband <laughs> as an extracurricular <laughs> okay um what really made me chuckle about it, though, is it had a completion date that was not far <laughs> in advance. <laughs> so I'm like, hmm, oh, no. I don't know what that means for this person's wife or That's partner. Um, yeah. But, you know, there's there's all kinds of ways or I, I think the most kind of inappropriate way to do it is like when they were trying to double count across multiple things and you're just like, please don't do this. Don't mark it as this, 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 and this. Yeah. It needs to be just one. Just so one. yeah, there's, there were lots of odd ones, but that one will always make me chuckle. <laughs> That's a good one. We get that question. Should I put being a mom as an activity? Should I be a spouse? Whatever. Uh, my, my favorite one was a student who didn't get into school and I looked at his application and he had being a janitor as clinical experience because he was a janitor in a hospital. In a hospital. Yeah. Like, no, no my friend, that, that is not the classification. So yeah, yeah just don't know. All right. Grace asked, should I get a letter of recommendation from a DO even if it wouldn't be super strong? I noticed some DO schools require a letter from a physician. Well, Grace, if you notice some, then you're probably wrong because there's just one that we know of, at least according to the che choose DO, not cheese. That's what happens when you're in Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's cheese. Uh, the choose DO Explorer, which is the official kind of tool that the uh, Association of American Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine put out. Um, so go check that out. ARCOM, Arkansas College of Osteopathic Medicine, is the only one that requires one. Uh, Courtney, I'll, I'll defer to you on this. Uh, how important is that DO letter when applying to DO schools? Is it important enough to get a weak letter? No. <laughs> I'm being honest. Um, you want, you want letters where there's, they know you, they can really advocate for you. They're using words like highly recommend, recommend without reservation. Um, you want the student, if, if it's just a checkbox and they're saying, I worked with this person for two hours, they seem fine. It's not really adding any value to the application. If it's a requirement then something is better than nothing because you have to fulfill that requirement. If it's just recommended, I would say, you know, if you have an MD that you've worked with where you've really built a better rapport and relationship and just had more time, that's going to be a lot more valuable. Yeah. Um, I'll share my screen here real quick. The um, So this is the Choose Dio Explorer. This is, again, kind of the official tool from the uh, from ACOM, again, the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine. I think I said that backwards last time. Uh, and then you can come in here and go, hey, requires a letter from a physician, from a DO. There's only one that requires, and it is still ARCOM, again, at least according to this official one. There are some that um, require from a MD or DO, and some will say like they highly recommend a DO, but um, if you can't, you can't. I wouldn't. I would prefer probably again a, a stronger MD letter than a weaker DO letter. So. Yeah, and and again, I will shout this from the mountaintops as many times as it needs to be said: is it's not an us versus them. A lot of the faculty that teach at DO schools are MDs, right? This is we're we're both physicians. And so coming in either in your personal statement or feeling for your letters that one is lesser than or other than is, is not really the mentality that that's there or that should be there. And so both are accepted, both are good, go with your strongest, unless you're applying to ARCOM, it's a requirement, you have to have it. Um, if you wanna go out of your way to, to get the DO one, 
just know it's going to go to all the schools, right? If you attach it, that that is a difference between the two platforms, between MCAS and ACOMIS. Once you upload it into your application, it's going out to everyone. Um, so if it's not your strongest and it's not required, I don't know if you want to use it. Yeah. Yeah. So just be careful. Yeah. So so just to expand on that that point that Courtney you just made for AMCAS, you can have um, 10 letters in AMCAS and then you apply to 10 schools and you uh, send two letters to one school, two different letters to another school, three letters to one school. You can pick and choose which and where, wherever things go. For TMDSAS and ACOMAS, all the letters go to all the schools. So that's a big difference. Jackie, thanks for all you guys do. You're welcome. I'm currently a sophomore. When is a good time to join Application Academy? Uh, when you are applying to medical school. So uh, right now, applications open next month. We have had our Application Academy cohort going since January. So uh, typically the, the year you're starting, you can sign up. You can probably sign up October, November, December timeframe if you want to get started that early. But usually within kind of six to eight months of the application cycle opening. We also have pre-med pathway for those who are in undergrad. You can start working with us now if you want to with Verenia and myself. Um, you know, yep. We both have experience with undergrad and graduate and med school advising. So if you wanted to start now and kind of pave that path and start meeting with us, you can, but it's, it's just not application Academy. It's through pre-med pathway. Just so you know. Yeah. Jason asks, a few of my work and activities experiences are highlighted in my personal statement. Do I need to pick new experiences for activity descriptions or repeat them because they're meaningful? Bernie, we get this question a lot yeah. and we see lots of common mistakes that students make. I'm like, where's your shadowing activity? Why is it, Why don't you have it? And they're like, oh, I talked about it in my personal statement. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, yeah. no. Yeah, yeah, no, the personal statement... Um doesn't have to, um, you don't want to repeat what you are talking about in your activities necessarily in your personal statement. So obviously these are the, the activities that motivated you that, that were meaningful to you. So of course, yeah, you're going to reflect on them and talk about them in your personal statement if they're connected to your why medicine in some way. Um, but what we do encourage you to do is think of an activity. And if you've highlighted a particular patient interaction in your personal statement around that activity, maybe talk about something different that occurred in that same location or in that same place where you were volunteering or whatever it is. So it's not verbatim what you said in your personal statement, but it's still, you know, it's still something you did. So of course, yeah, you're going to talk about it again in your um, activities description. So that's fine. Just maybe focus on a different patient interaction or maybe some other kind of, you know, takeaway or, or, or impact that the experience had on you or that you had on the experience itself. Yeah. That's so all. same experience, but different stories. Correct. Yeah. Grace again, do med schools consult each other in a way that if a student is accepted at one school, they wouldn't be accepted at another. So other students can get the spot. We were actually just talking about this last night. Um, so the AAMC uh, specifically has traffic rules, new traffic rules as of uh, maybe three years old now, four years old, that um, specifically prohibit this, um, this kind of communication. So historically, Grace, before these new traffic rules, schools could log into a system and see where you have been accepted and, and potentially go, hey, we wanted to uh, accept Grace. Let's see if, where she's gotten in and, uh, and and see, well, did 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 they get into Harvard? Did they get into wherever? And they're like, oh, well, Grace already got into those schools, so they're not going to come to our school. Well, they don't they don't allow that anymore. So the answer is no. Uh, if a school wants to accept you, theoretically, they should accept you. And again, it's up to you to kind of turn down that acceptance. And then they'll get a list later on <laughs> to see every place you've been accepted, but should not affect the acceptance decision anymore.
Rithbeck. Uh, I'm currently a junior graduating after this semester, taking a one-year master's program that has a clinical immersion program. Can I include this clinical immersion program on my activities list? Courtney, it's I'll be interested. Clinical. <laughs> well, no, it's even more so. Like, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. We typically call the activities list the extracurricular list, right? And this potentially is the definition of curricular. It's part of his school. And it always comes up like, well, I did a study abroad. Well, is that curricular, extracurricular? Is activities technically extracurricular? What are your thoughts here? For my myself personally, if you received a grade for it, it's curricular. And then I wouldn't double count it. It's not time spent away um, kind of on top of curriculum that you spent doing other activities. So that's how I personally would have viewed it. I don't know if every school will view it that way. Yeah. Um, but generally, if it's for a grade, it's part of a class, you're not going to get double credit for it, essentially. Yeah, that's generally how I think about it. But then sometimes I'll be like, oh, research, go ahead and put it on there. They're like, but it was for a class. I'm like, ah, it's research. <laughs> yeah, I, right. See, there are those like nuances. Yeah. It depends or... Yeah. You know, part of your thesis was also research and things like that. But yeah. from what this person is saying, like if they're it's part of training for a class. Um, yeah, I think. Not, yeah, go ahead. it's not it's not like you went out and sought out this opportunity because you wanted to. You were really interested and passionate about it. It's it's part of your program. Yeah, that's the way I see it. Landon, current RRT. I have a personal statement, I'm assuming, but I'm not sure I have that aha moment. I find myself daily wanting more, wanting the knowledge and responsibilities that's sufficient or understandable to committees. Bernia, eh, when we talk about kind of your seed and watering events and writing personal statements, do we ever mention aha moments? <laughs> All the time. When you All the time. Me? Everyone knows. Exactly. They can pinpoint the minute they realize. Lightning I wanna struck. A, I want to be a doctor. <laughs> no, yeah. no, no. Absolutely not. It, it it's, it's rarely an aha moment. So sometimes it's just an organic, you know, thing that sort of develops over time because of your own personal experiences. So don't try to find that aha moment. Just think big picture. Um, what was that first kind of exposure or thing that made me start thinking about, I like helping people in this manner. I like uh, impacting health in this way and, and what was happening around that time. Um, it's just really self-reflecting, asking the folks around you, do you remember me talking about this? Did I say anything about this? Um, getting feedback from them, that helps. Um, and then really, you know, like I said, just self-reflecting. There is, there may not be that aha moment, but you can kind of identify the moments where you realize I can really make an impact somehow, some way by doing this. Yeah. Um, you just have to think about it. Yep. Yes, yes. Yeah, so Landon, I would want to know what brought you to be a, uh, mm -hmm. a respiratory therapist to begin with. Yep. Because that's a very interesting career field. And then and then why mm -hmm. why now wanting to pursue medicine. I want to hear that story. Man, JFK is busy today, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Lots Lots of of uh, I worked as a medical assistant and shadowed at the same office. Can I write about them separately as shadowing and clinical or should I pick one? Both is fine. Yeah. As long as you do them separately. Yeah. Don't count. Like separate your hours. Mm -hmm. Yep. Don't double count. Tevi, I took a lot of my science classes in high school in my dual credit program. I only have six classes left in my undergrad degree program. Should I retake the science classes now or take them after I graduate? Ooh, is one of those. <laughs> I know I like I, I was a student. Maybe I just was completely ignorant to this whole process and competitiveness to everything. Like I took zero AP credits. I didn't even know what dual enrollment was. And like, look at me. I went to med school. I don't understand. Everyone's trying to rush through all of this stuff. And maybe it's cheaper. Maybe that's the reason. Yeah. Um, 
Courtney, uh, if you're looking at a student who has a lot of dual enrollment courses, those are college courses, um, typically done through a community college. Do you have any concerns about retaking those or um, just higher level courses? Because only only six at the university level potentially is a question mark. Yeah, I mean, having sat in on as many adcom meetings as I did, I think there there's probably a slight preference for taking them at a four-year institution college if you can. Um, sometimes we'll see this manifest just in grades that are kind of reflected um, results of having taken dual credit and then starting at a higher level once you do reach the university instead of those introductories. Um, so usually if we see struggle in those upper level science courses that are now being bumped up and taken freshman, sophomore year, that, you know, that can kind of happen, that can kind of skew your GPA. If, you know, those are kind of foundational prereq science coursework, you took them in high school, you need to recall that information for your MCAT, which you're now taking much later on. Sometimes it can be reflective in in a score there if you haven't retaught yourself that material. So there's a number of places where we'll kind of look for indicators that may give us some information on um, if you're retaining that information or not. So I think it's up to you. When are you taking your MCAT? Would it be beneficial to retake those classes now? Have you looked at the schools that you plan on applying to? You know, are you know, with it being dual credit, it shouldn't be a problem, but have you just double checked? Things like that. So those are my thoughts on this question. Yeah. Why do ORMs have score higher on MCAT compared to URM? So, Juan. Sorry. What? So can we skip this question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would love to. Um, so first of all, ORM is not a term. URM is. ORM is just um, typically white people saying, I, I'm white and I'm discriminated against. Um, the, yeah, why? I mean, <laughs> should we get into systemic racism discussions on this on this episode? Um, and how in our country we have disproportionate or um, maybe that's not the right word. Uh, we have disparate funding of school education systems from elementary school to all the way to high school um, based on uh, house prices and home prices and um, sales tax and um, what do you call it? property taxes. That's what that's called. Um, and all kinds of stuff. And yeah, when you force specific populations into specific areas and then don't give them the resources to succeed like you give other people, it shows up on the MCAT. Well, and, and guess what? They're still graduating and they're still really excellent physicians. And yeah. so mm -hmm. a lot of the times these same people that are arguing like, why is the MCAT weighted so heavily and blah, 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 when we don't weight it heavily then they're the same ones to call foul. So lots of thoughts on this question, but, and who's to even say that this is like happening for only underrepresented. I had a lot of really excellent high scoring underrepresented students that yeah. would probably be offended that mm -hmm. you would think that they were lesser mm -hmm. than or scored lower. Right. So, That's well, the we, we do have good data. The AAMC does Thankfully, uh, I think it's one of the transparent things they do is they do publish a lot of data that shows that black students score about 10 points lower on average than their white counterparts. Um, Hispanics are about uh, and Latino students are about, I think, six or seven points lower. Um, so there is a very significant difference. Um, but it's it's super multifactorial in terms of why it's happening. Mm hmm. So yeah, fun, fun, fun talk. <laughs> you have two two URMs 
here yes. as your hosts. And so <laughs> we're going to get a little bit bristly at this question. <laughs> yes. Courtney, you are very white passing, but you are Latina. Yeah. Um, and Verinia, you are less white passing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm yeah. super white. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we, we, it's a fun conversation. We, we obviously, one of our big missions is to try to democratize this whole process to make it fair for everyone getting in. So yeah, we, we have strong thoughts. <laughs> Back to, I think it was Miriam again. Does being a CNA count for clinical experience? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it clinical? We finally got one. Yeah. Yeah. Good to go. Yeah, they, 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 uh, I don't know why. Again, there, there are these, this theme that comes across, and it's, it comes, it happens often enough that I wonder if there's some post out there that when students Google, they read this thing that clinical experience, you have to be working with a doctor. I'm like, no, the doctor part has nothing to do with clinical experience. It's what you're doing with patients that matters. So. Good clinical experience. Zayad, uh, what are med schools' thoughts if all pre meds were taking uh, taken out of community college? Uh, Courtney, you, you touched on this briefly, right there. There potentially is some bias um, for community college courses. But you kind of got to do what you got to do sometimes too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if it's only your prereqs being taken there, I think they would have a question as to why that was and why you were doing that. You know, if they were taken during summer periods, that kind of makes sense. You know, maybe you were going home. And so this was the easiest way to take them in a condensed amount of time. So they'll look at all factors around that, but, but there may be some questions as to it or how rigorous the coursework was or the lab component that was involved because community colleges typically don't have the same lab resources. So potentially a little bit of a stigma there enough to keep you out of med school. No, or else they would have said that up front, but, but they're going to be looking at uh, a couple different data points there. Yep, yep. Christina, I started a post back program the same year I graduated college, retook the same courses. I did good, same year in college, but did bad during post back due to personal issues. How should I proceed? I started a post back program the same year I graduated college. I did good the same year in college. I don't understand the question. <laughs> Were they taking post back classes while college they were taking college classes? Because the definition of post back is after you graduate college. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Either of you? Um, I think maybe they were saying they did good in college, but bad in the post back, which then makes me wonder why you took the post back in the first place. But that's a separate issue. Um, so I don't know if you, Christina, if you want to kind of clarify the question or Courtney, if you have insight into this. I mean, yeah. I was interpreting it the same way you were, Vernia, where okay. they just retook some of the upper mm -hmm. division courses in a post-bac setting. And when they retook them, they didn't do as well. Hopefully I'm in, okay. I graduated first, then took a post-bac. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, you, it's not good. Troubling not place to be. Yeah. 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 So what are next steps? Potentially, right? How, Vernia, how does how yeah. does a student recover from potentially doing well in college? Let, let's assume maybe they were a non-science major and so mm -hmm. they did post back to take their science courses mm -hmm. and then personal issues kind of tank to that. Yeah, I would um, first take a step back, decide what, you know, how can I, am I prepared now to maybe try this again, right? That's the kind of the goal. Try this again, retake some of those courses again, um, but you need some distance from whatever was happening so that it doesn't happen again. Um, and then when the time comes, hopefully, you know, you want to show that, um, you know, a, a grades, right, as, as high as possible to kind of distance yourself from what happened before. And then when the time comes to apply, you can kind of potentially address some of 
that in your application. Um, but you just want to keep showing that although you had this kind of uh, poor performance or whatever the first time around, you tried again and did better. It's not going to look great but you wanna to continue to show improvement and potentially maybe talk about what those issues were somewhere in the application. Um, you know, you see how, how you can address that. I think it's okay to try again. Yeah, it reminds me of um, a podcast episode. Let me Google it real quick. Um, Chad, who was a student, undergrad student, who had a family, young, because he did, <laughs> um, uh, struggled in school because he was working to support his family mm -hmm. uh, in, in undergrad and wanted to go to med school and so went and did a post back program. Uh, he is episode 230, so if you check out premedyears.com slash 230. Um, he went and did a post back, but didn't change anything. He was still working to support his family, and he still struggled. And he applied to Caribbean schools and was rejected from Caribbean schools because they're like, yeah, no, even we have lines that we won't cross. And uh, and he was like, OK, now what? And so he wanted to be a doctor and he went and did a a master's level kind of special master's program and changed his his responsibilities. They sacrificed as a family. Uh, they went on uh, government assistance programs and and he did what he needed to do so that he could focus on being a student. And guess what? Shocker. He is a good student when he can actually focus on just being a student and not also supporting his family. Got into school and now he's a, I believe, a second year uh, surgical resident as a, a non-trad student. So great story. Go listen to that episode. It's just going to take some time and some rearranging at this point. And unfortunately, because it's it's America, it's going to take some money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but don't jump right in again, right? So take yes. a take a moment <laughs> to to plan this out. Pause. Pause. Mm -hmm. Milzy, as a non-trad student, is it a red flag that some of my prereqs were taken on a slower timeline, meaning that I took a lighter load of one to two classes at a time? My total GPA is 393. Again, another very common concern, Courtney, is I'm a non-trad. I work full-time. I have a family, whatever. My, my outside responsibilities will only allow me to take one or two classes at a time. How, how much of a, an issue is that? I'd say that's okay because I am looking at the totality of how your time is divided to see if you can handle either multitasking or multiple things going on at once. Now, if you were doing nothing else and only these classes, then it may be problematic, right? Because I would I would worry that you'd be able to handle 36 credit hours of heavy science course load all at once. But if you have simultaneous things going on and, and this is what you could do on top of those things, that's not problematic to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's, there's always this, thought of like everything is viewed in a, a silo, right? Oh, no. one to two classes. That's not good. But one to two classes while also seeing that you're working, while also potentially being able to see maybe you're not calling it out specifically, but potentially being able to see that you are a parent uh, from some of your activities, I can tell that then. Yeah, right. Uh, I think there's there's an understanding. Um, and I had this I've had this conversation with lots of directors of admissions, like for non traditional student, if you have less clinical experience because you have all of these other responsibilities, we're not expecting you to to be equal to a traditional student who isn't doing anything but partying, going to school and doing clinical experience. Yep. Right. You're different. And that's OK. And sometimes that's even better. Again, there's value in having life experience, grit, resilience, maturity, social awareness, you know, some yep. of these things that take just sheer time of living uh, to to gain for a lot of people. So these are not bad things. It's not a red flag, especially if you are doing well in them, because that's what they're going to expect. If you're only taking two classes, and I say only on top of everything else that you're doing, 
they still want to see that you're doing well because that means that you can manage a lot of things going on at once. That gives me information that signals to me that you would probably removing those other things and focusing on this coursework, it seems like you would do well, that you're very studious, that you can stay on top of them, that you manage your time well. So a lot of good indicators coming from that. So no, not a red flag. Yep, yep. Time for one more quick question, if we have one, maybe. Let's do it. Let's do it. My personal statement focuses on a change in perspective about medicine from that of doing what's best for the patient to augmenting the patient's autonomy. Is that a viable response to why medicine? What on earth? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. This is this is one. I'll, I'll speak to this one since I I wrote the book on personal statements, the pre-med playbook guide to the medical school personal statement. Um, find it like your local book reseller. Um, this one borders on the um. I know what it's like to be a doctor kind of theme of like, I had some original thoughts on how I was going to be a doctor. I was going to do what's best for the patient, right? The patient's going to listen to me. I know what's best. And then I realized, oh, maybe patient autonomy is kind of important and letting a, a patient guide some of their own decision making, obviously with the best um, information at hand, uh, what we call informed consent. No, this is not a good personal statement. You're basically saying, I know what it's like to be a doctor and I know what to do and I'm already great at it versus why do you actually want to be a doctor? What led you to want to be a doctor? Not how are you going to practice as a physician? So, yep. yes, try that again. And if you haven't read the Premier Playbook Guide to the Medical School personal statement, check it out. Uh, Courtney Lewis, Verenia Granham. We have come to the close of another pre-med office hours. What is your one tip each as we are getting to a week away, um, less than a week away from applications opening up? One tip. Courtney Lewis. Make smart choices. <laughs> <laughs> no um, felonies, please. Um, no, just take a breath. Mm -hmm. Have other people... Check over your application, check for typos, check for mistakes, do that. And know that you put in a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of hours, a lot of work and that, and, and we do appreciate that. And we will see that value, but some of it is fate, some of it is timing, some of it is being strategic. So yeah, make smart choices, but trust the process. Bernie? Don't rush. Don't rush through this. Present a strong application. If you're not ready on May, you know, whatever the day it is that it opens, May 2nd, May 4th, that's okay. Just yep. give it give it time. Don't rush. Yep, yep. Um, enjoy the journey. Enjoy right? the journey. Yes. It's part of the journey. It's all learning. It's all growth. It's a Thank marathon. You. So this doesn't have to be the most stressful or miserable time. This could be a really exciting time right before you take a next step. So it can enjoy be. the process. Yes. We are the Medical School HQ advising team. We also have mapped our big software platform for students to track everything they're doing. Go check them out. We'll see you again next week.